Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Chris Enroth, horticulture educator. I'm talking to you right now from sunny McDonough County here in Macomb, Illinois, and it is a beautiful day today. Uh, we got a lot of information to present to you. Uh, if we go on to our next slide here, we're going to go ahead and get started. You can see we're going to talk about rain gardens today. And as you can see, I'm there on the left. Uh, that's me. And then Andrew Holsinger, he's also a horticulture educator with U of I Extension. He's going to be coming on after I wrap up here. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, you know, plant selection and, and more about what we want to be planting in our rain garden. But before we get started with Andrew's section, I would like to talk to you about uh, kind of the basics of rain gardens and then when we look at designing rain gardens so again we have a lot to get to today I want to tell if there's any uh, any moderators coordinators at your site location we're gonna need you at the computer here real quick because we've got a couple polls for you we want you to pull your audience so if we go to our next slide um, this is our pop quiz that we're throwing at you right here so the first question let's see if technology works for us right here um, I guess I have to clear this excuse me one second All right, the poll is opened up, and I want you to uh, query your audience and ask them how many participants in your audience have a rain garden on their property. Our options are none. We have one to three participants in your audience have a rain garden, four to six, or six or more in your audience have a rain garden. So if you don't mind just clicking on the button which one it is. Um, if you want to abstain and don't want to vote, there is also that option there too. So I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds here, uh, tally up those numbers, and let's see how many people have a rain garden on their property that are listening in. All right, a few more seconds. Three, two, one, and polls are closed. Now let me see. Okay, everybody can see the results here, so uh, and, and hopefully you're getting this. And, and so right now I have about 71% here have no rain gardens on their property. About 25% have about... Uh, one to three participants with the rain garden and we, hey we have uh, uh, some gr groups out there that do have uh, you know four to six participants with rain garden so that's really cool that's great okay next poll and I'm probably gonna have to edit this one first so just bear with me when I pull this one up clear the votes all right poll is open. Do any of your master gardener programs have a rain gardener project? I know we have a lot of master gardeners uh, that listen into these, so I just want to poll and see, you know, do any of your master gardener projects, do they have one? This is just simple, yes or no. This is great. Lots. Of, looks like we have some out there. Some do have projects, so just a couple more seconds here. All right. And we're going to close this up. Poll is closed now. And so you can see, um, you know, we do have some Master Gardener programs out there. Uh, some of your projects do have rain gardens involved. So that's great. Uh, so about 31% do. That's nine votes. About 20 people voted. That's 69% say that there is not a rain garden. Uh, and that might just do to site constraints or whatnot. So let's go to the final question. And this is going to have a chat box. Uh, so I want you to uh, enter this into your chat box when I pull up the, the PowerPoint here again. And the question here is, go ahead and start. You can type this into the chat. Um, why rain gardens important? So uh, survey your audience and, and please feel free to type that into the chat box. Just want to get a gauge and see what folks, you know, what what do they know about them and, and, and how do they feel? What, why are they important? Filters runoff, it's great. Yep, yep, it'll capture water runoff. Excellent. Oh, these are great responses. Erosion, wildlife, birds. Um, you know, if you have flat, you got have that water go somewhere. Water conservation, flooding. 
Um, great, clean water, you know, the importance of having clean water because it's scarce, uh, filtration, environment. These are all just, these are wonderful responses. So this is great. Um, so that makes me really excited then for the rest of the, the session here. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started. We're on slide five. Now we're going to progress to the next slide here, the slide six. Um, and I want to first start off and talk about where we are coming from. From So prior to European settlement, our, our state, most of it, was just this vast wetland prairie. And, and actually settlers, when they purchased land in the, the state of Illinois and they would move in across the state in the summer months, it would, been, it would be dry. Um, and then they would find out in the fall, winter, and spring months that, that you know, that's when the rains would come and they found out they're in this big wetland. And, you know, they actually, a lot of crops rotted and, and a lot of folks died and had to relocate as a result of this. And so, and then began our effort to dewater our uh, wetland prairie landscape. And so with the, the creation of clay tiling and these days plastic tiling, now uh, you can see on the image there on the right, that's, that's more of what uh, our, our so-called prairie looks like these days. Uh, the image on the left there is actually uh, a picture taken of, uh, uh, the term is called a buffalo wallow. And these are just, you know, if you've ever been in central Illinois, uh, you know that it's very flat. And so where's that water gonna go? Well, it's going to pool together in kind of the lower areas. And, and these were termed buffalo wallow and buffalo they would wallow in there and so you know I think that uh, you know it's uh, two different ways of looking at the landscape let's get into uh, kind of what the conventional water ethic has has been um, and it really follows these three words this mon this collect convey discharge uh, with this method water is pretty much considered a nuisance it's a waste product and it has to be removed as quickly and efficiently as possible so that's where we start seeing uh, you know images like this of streams that uh, that are nice and meandering we straighten them uh, we armor them with concrete or some type of riprap rock and you know and we just we shunt that water into our streams and into our rivers um, you know so I think and this is it's great to see that a lot of design professionals and engineer professionals are starting to turn the corner here and starting to consider the natural hydrolo hydrological character of an area uh, as they're uh, tackling projects so hopefully you'll be seeing less of these types of uh, you know cement streams and and more of a stream restoration so this is a, a important thing to know here and you know maybe you're sitting there and thinking well so what uh, well you know regardless of if it's salt water fresh water we have a lot of contaminants that we use uh, in this world and there's a lot of sediment loads out there also in our waterways and this is polluting water that we then have to spend more energy on cleaning and so you know clean water is very critical uh, for us you know the arid west it's in a constant struggle to locate water resources out there and you know I even read that there has been a proposal by water managers out west to have a pipeline run from the Mississippi River out uh, to cities like Las Vegas and places like that so a legitimate proposal I don't know if it's actually gonna happen but it, I just remember reading that also you know our water infrastructure is aging the American Society of Civil and Engineers gave our water infrastructure a D minus this means it's dangerously compromised um, you know you go to the EPA website and you can see that leaky water mains our potable water accounts for a loss of 1 trillion gallons of water per year 1 trillion that that is just a huge number and I can't really think of anything to kind of help us visualize it but that you know except saying 1 trillion that's a lot and really, you know, the funds aren't there to replace these systems. And so, you know, we need to do our part to relieve some of the burden. And, and rain gardens is one of the tools we can use. Um, and, and also, you know, we simply, you know, we can't design our landscapes to flush water away as quickly as possible. You know, if we follow this collect, convey, discharge mantra, um, you know, we will be designing our landscapes, uh, you know, to contribute to this problem. And so, um, you know, we want to be able to handle what stormwater we can on our own properties. And that's that's one of the things uh, when we talk about just being kind of a good neighbor policy. So even though your home or landscape lies far away from any stream or river, you know, everything eventually will drain into our streams, into our rivers, um, you know, so it's it's time to turn around and, and stop treating these uh, as extensions of our sewers essentially 
So we're starting now on slide nine. Um, we're getting into designing your rain guard now. Let's get into the topic here. And I want to cover a little bit of how we can then begin the design process here of understanding our property. Now, let's first just lay this out. Let's define rain gardens here. A uh, rain garden is a simple depression in the ground that detains runoff each time there is a storm event. As you can see in the, the picture here, uh, it illustrates the, the essentially the rainwater hits the roof, travels through the gutter, and goes into the swale and into the rain garden. Uh, you can see there's inlets and outlets. You know, we're not building a pond here. We only want to capture as much water as we've designed our rain garden to hold and release. And there's other components, and we'll get into this here later. On this next slide, you will see an aerial photograph. Now, when a professional designer starts uh, you know, landscape design, 99% of them see your property from this angle, and it's called the plan view. Uh, this is how it's trained. This is how I preferred to work. But let me just say that uh, you know, looking at aerial photos and maps, this is no way to substitute uh, an experience firsthand on what's occurring on a site. So luckily, most of you are homeowners that are listening in, and you're interested in applying this to your property or maybe of a master gardener project. Um, you are already, you have this intimate connection, hopefully, with that, with your project that you're interested in doing. So when planning your rain garden, here is where, um, you know, or what I want you to begin to see on your property. So just to, to orient you with this aerial, uh, what you're seeing are the fairgrounds here in uh, McDonough County. Uh, the fairgrounds are primarily on the left side of the photo. And then the extension office is that smaller building on the right side of the, that large parking lot. And so, uh, you know, we have a lot of roof area. Uh, there's a lot of barns here. And there's very large parking areas. And this all sheds water. So where does that water go? This is when we start to diagram the topography of our landscape. So on the next slide, I have removed the aerial photograph, but I have kept the outline of all the structures and the paved areas. So, and, and also there's very faint contour lines. A contour line just represents changes in elevation. It helps to define the general shape of topographic features. It just, just helps us to kind of read the landscape. Uh, having these aren't necessary, but they are helpful. Anyway, I have placed uh, plus and minus signs that indicate high points and low points. Uh, you can see that for the high points, I include both the roofs and then also areas on the ground, which are, you know, high up on the site. Um, and, and on this side, the primary low point is in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, you can see the little minus sign there on the bottom left-hand corner. On the next slide here, uh, after we study the topography, the, the hydrology of our property, it starts to become more apparent. Topography, it plays a major role in directing how we move water or how water moves across uh, the landscape. So for your rain garden, you want to collect water off of roofs, downspouts, pavement, patios, etc. You know, you don't want to be putting your rain garden in the middle of a gushing stream. Uh, you know, it's just not going to be a, a, a happy result for you. Uh, you know, the water will erode, it will damage plantings, it'll wash things away. So, um, you know, make sure you begin to identify where we should be placing these and, and where, what water you're going to be capturing here. So, step outside when it's raining. Obviously not when it's lightning, uh, but uh, observe how the water moves across the landscape. You might notice that instead of one large rain garden, perhaps a series of smaller rain gardens would work best for your site. So sketch out what you observe and how stormwater behaves on your property. On this slide here, you can see I've diagrammed the water movement using arrows, which shows the direction of flow coming off of these high points. Um, and so this is something you would just do when you're outside in a rain, or if you really know your property, is something that um, that you can do. But it's always good out, good to just go outside, look around, and sketch these things out. On the next slide, after observing, uh, now we've diagrammed how the water is moving over the property. You can start to delineate the watershed. Uh, a watershed is an area that drains to a single point, and in this example, that point is our low point there in that bottom left-hand corner. So, obviously, this is a very large-scale example. You know, perhaps your watershed is a driveway, a patio, or maybe just a, a portion of your home's roof. But regardless of the scale, the methods of observations that I just, you know, spoke of, these 
these observations, they still remain the same. So you're still going to be looking for these same things. The topography, how does the water move with the site? Diagram it out. Um, you know, that's all very important to do. On the next slide, um, this is a, a, a much smaller scale example, as you can see. But even on a small property here, a homeowner can encounter widely varying microclimates. You know, we're talking about sunshade patterns, prevailing winds, structures uh, can influence these conditions, and it makes your property unique to your neighbor's property. So, you know, for example, south facing slopes are hotter and drier than north facing slopes. Lower areas typically slower to dry than upland areas. Shade from trees cool an area which slows evaporation. But they also intercept rain before it hits the soil beneath the canopy, so it might be drier. Um, you know, and there's all these other things that can create these little microclimates on your property. And so just going out and being mindful of this and diagramming those things out. Okay, now I want you at this point to get to know your property's soils. Knowing your soils, these are critical for ensuring you can build a rain garden in the first place, and then you know, you know, make sure that water infiltrates into the soil so you avoid having a bog garden, which is a complete talk, all, a different talk altogether. Um, so let's first look at these tool soil, soil tests. These aren't necessarily required, but I think that they're really helpful for you as a homeowner to become familiar with your soil. So let's start here on slide 17. Uh, with the soil ribbon test. This is a pretty simple one. You get a ball of soil, uh, you squeeze it. If it falls apart, that's sandy soil. If the, you can form uh, a ball with it but not a, a ribbon, that's a loamy sand type soil. If you can form a ball and a ribbon, as you can see the, uh, in the image there on the left, he's using his thumb and forefinger to push that soil out and try to form a ribbon. Um, you know, you have to see how long of a ribbon you can make. And greater than two inches, uh, guess what? You're probably like a lot of people here, and you have a very heavy clay soil. Um, so you know you can just you can follow these instructions here on the slide, and there's a little table here that also helps to indicate the uh, the soil type based on the ribbon. Also, we have the soil jar test, and this is we're now on slide 18. Uh, for this test, get a clear glass or plastic jar. You place a scoop of soil within. Fill the jar with water and then I like to put a drop of dish soap in there this helps break up surface tension it allows particles to settle faster uh, and then you give the jar a good you know five minute shake I'd say you know you're making a some excellent martini for James Bond here so shake the, the jar uh, then you place it somewhere on your kitchen counter where it can sit for a few days the sand being the largest particle will settle out almost immediately Silt particles, being the, the next uh, smallest uh, part, particle, will settle down about 20 to 40 minutes after that. Clay particles being extremely small, the smallest particle, will take a couple days. Once the water becomes clear, you take a ruler um, and you measure the depth of each soil particle layer. And you can see on the image here, it might be kind of small on your handout, it may be even on the projector screen, but, um, uh, you know, in person, these layers are fairly apparent of the sand, silt, and clay. You can see the textures change, colors change, and so you take your ruler and you measure the depth of each layer. And then you uh, determine the percent of the whole for each layer. So let's make math easy, because that's that's how um, my I have to do that, because yeah, I need easy math here. So if we have four inches total of soil that's settled out, and uh, of those four inches, we have two inches of sand, two inches of clay. Guess what? We have 50% sand, 50% clay. You then use this chart uh, pictured here on the right. It's called the soil textural triangle. Uh, use this to determine your soil texture. Obviously, if you have high sand soil, your rain garden is going to drain quickly. Um, however, if you fall into that, that high clay category, uh, anticipate slower infiltration rates. Uh, and if you're wondering, uh, kind of that ideal soil texture we're all shooting for in our landscapes is that loamy soil there towards the middle bottom. Uh, so that's kind of what we all, all really want. But um, some of us have that really high clay soil. Uh, once you've narrowed down the locations of your rain garden, you must conduct a soil infiltration test. So this is the required test you must do at the site where you are thinking to do your rain garden. An infiltration test is going to measure the rate at which your soil drains. And later, we're actually going to use this drainage rate to inform how deep to make your rain garden and what the area should be of your rain garden. Um, 
you have a handout with you. It's uh, I believe it's called Engineering Your Rain Garden, and it goes into this. So I'm not going to uh, go into these steps, but uh, I think the one thing the instructions don't mention is it's, I, I I recommend uh, doing this test twice as the second go around. I think that will mimic more field condition types. Um, and and you and you know if you're doing this when the soil is really dry, it might just soak it up like a sponge. So, um, you know, I'd say do the infiltration infiltration test twice and and just compare the results of one and two. Um, and so so this is in your handout. So I'm not going to get too much into this. If you do read through the instructions and you have questions. Um, Please feel free to type them into the chat box uh, or at the end of the session here. Uh, you know, when after Andrew speaks, feel free to turn on your mic and uh, ask us questions then. Now, while we're talking about drainage rates and how long water is going to be, uh, you know, sitting on our yards here, this question usually comes up: What about mosquitoes? Well. I asked our extension entomologist, Dr. Phil Nixon, and he said mosquitoes need two weeks of placid water to complete their life cycle to adulthood. So that's a fair amount of time. Most of our rain gardens would probably be drained within you know, a couple days at least. But there is a general rule of thumb, which is really just good politics. Um, and you know you don't want your rain garden to be the eyesore of the neighborhood with standing water in it for weeks at a time. Um, you know we shoot for draining our rain gardens within a 24-hour period. You could stretch that to 48, but I would really suggest sticking with 24 hours. On slide 21, um, I, I think it is a great idea to, to get to know what vegetation exists on your property and around your property, see what plants are occurring naturally. Um, if you need help identifying anything, you can always get in touch with the Extension Office, uh, Master Gardener Help Desk, our DDDI system. Uh, you can ask a Master Naturalist for a list of native plants in your area. So I, I, there's, uh, Extension is really here and set up to help you identify vegetation on your property and then give recommendations as well. And Andrew's going to talk more about plants though. Okay, let's get into the designing your rain garden. We're going to get into some calculations here. Again, it's going to be in your handout, so I'm not really going to cover too much. But before we do that, I'm going to do kind of these this list of, of areas that you want to avoid. So you want to have your rain garden. You want to avoid areas, I'm sorry, avoid areas that are less than 10 feet from a foundation. Now, if you have a basement, I might even stretch that out to 20 feet away. Um, also avoid areas with a shallow water table. If you dig your infiltration uh, test hole and you know you dig down about 12 inches and you find water to fill the hole without you you doing you're not doing it it's just filling the hole. Well, guess what? You have a shallow water table. So where's that rain gonna where's that rain gonna drain to if there's already water in the soil? It's not. So we don't want to put a rain garden there. Obviously, call Julie, um, you know, or your local utility locate company to come out and locate utilities because we don't want to be putting these over utilities. Um, areas near large trees where you might be damaging existing roots, avoid those. If you have a slope of a hillside that's greater than 15%, that's too steep. We don't want to put rain gardens on those. Um, we we might run into uh, landslide landslide problems there if we start putting lots of water into the soil there. Also, locations that are higher than the downspout. This is kind of a, a, a no-brainer thing, but you know, if gravity can't feed the water into your rain garden, you don't want to be engineering some type of pump system to be doing it. So gravity is your friend here. So make sure that it's below the downspout and behind retaining walls. Most retaining walls are not designed to handle the water pressure that is created from rain gardens. And so um, if you do have an area with retaining wall, you might have to re-engineer it, uh, have a professional come out and rebuild it uh, specifically to handle the, the low, the, the, the pressure that's going to be uh, exerted on it by uh, increased soil water. OK, on slide 24. We are going to start the calculation for sizing our rain gardens. Now, you should have a handout. Again, it's titled Engineering Your Rain Garden. This is one of two that you should have for this talk. This handout walks you through each step. 
in calculating the size of your rain garden. So again, I'm not spending too much time on this because me and math, that's a train wreck. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, just, we'll just leave it at that. But I do want to touch on this table here. It lists the coefficients of runoff. Now, the uh, coefficient of runoff is the percentage of water that drains off of one of the listed surfaces. Here you can see I've circled the roof surface. Um, and they say the typical range here is 0.75 to 0.9. They like the middle ground of 0.85. What do these numbers mean? Well, they're actually percentages. And they just leave them in decimal form so we can plug them into an equation on the next slide. So on a roof, it's basically stating anywhere from 75 to 90 percent of the water that falls on that roof will wind up in the gutter. And of course they recommend 80, using 85 percent. What happens to the remaining water that doesn't make it to the gutter? Well, it evaporates, it splashes off or runs right over and misses the gutter. Uh, so compare that to, you know, we have hardscape surfaces here of concrete brick, uh, pavers, and then we have more of landscape beds, softscape, lawns. Um, you can see how the coefficients of runoff, how they, they differ. So obviously the higher coefficient of runoff, the more water you're going to have. So let's go to the next slide and see where we plug this number in. The next step here, it's on your handout uh, on slide 25. Uh, this is uh, the drainage rate, uh, and we have to calculate the runoff area. And then we add in that coefficient of runoff to make it the effective runoff area. We have to adjust this number. Um, and, and, and this is the area which will be draining into our rain garden. So here are the examples of 24 by 40 foot roof. We simply want to find the area by multiplying these two dimensions, length times width. And then we, add, we multiply in the coefficient of runoff. And here we use 0.85, we get 850 square feet. Uh, again, this is just to adjust that area for the actual amount uh, of, of area that we'll, we'll be receiving water from. On the next slide, slide 26, now we have to calculate how much water is going to run off in our rain garden. So let's assume a rainfall intensity of one inch per hour. Let's use our 850 square feet from the previous slide, and we're going to use a duration of one hour for our rain event. And uh, one inch per hour, duration of one hour, these are just standard calculations here. Um, so you plug the your um, you plug your square footage into the equation and you get seventy one cubic feet of water that your your rain garden will be receiving. We're gonna come back to this number in the next step. But next we're going to determine the depth of our rain garden on slide twenty seven. We are going to use that drainage rate, which we would determine from our infiltration test. And again, we are going to state that our rain garden must be drained within 24 hours. Um, so within the brackets, you can see um, on the left side, that is the drainage rate we got from our infiltration test. We're just we're going to say for this example, one inch per it drains one inch every six hours. Convert that in inches per day, and we wind up having four inches per day. So if you want to drain your rain garden in 24 hours, and your drainage rate is 24 inches per day. How deep should your rain garden be? Four inches. So I want to note right here that on average, rain gardens are usually only about four to six, maybe eight inches deep. We never want to go deeper than 12 inches because that's just getting too deep. Again, we're getting into that, that pond you know, landscape feature and not really the rain garden. 12 inches is just holds too big of a volume of water. Um, so we want to avoid that. So about four to six inches, maybe eight inches, never deeper than 12 inches. I might mention this later, but I just wanted to hit it right here. OK, on slide 28, now we are at the final step of the calculations. Here we're going to plug in all the numbers we've been calculating to determine the area of our rain garden. What should the square footage be? So we plug in our 71 cubic feet of water that it will be receiving. We divide it by our depth of four inches which we convert to feet within this equation, and then we wind up getting a 213 square foot rain garden. Now, if your head's spinning right now, that's okay. Mine is too, and I, un I kind of understand what I just said. Um, let me just say to you there is a rule of thumb here to sizing the rain garden, and that is it should be one-third the size of the area it is draining. And we come pretty close in that that uh, that uh, step those different equations there that we were going through. So um, 
for you non-engineers types and um, you know the rule of thumb rain garden one-third the size of the area it's draining okay now designing your rain garden here's some design tips maybe just a little bit of inspiration here I want to start off with looking at natives uh, natives are plants they are well adapted to our our regional macroclimates and some of our microclimates we might find here in the Midwest we go through swings of drought and you know just saturation so you know that's exactly what your rain garden is going to experience if we only select wet loving plants what happens when it doesn't rain for two to four weeks in the summer months after all these are rain gardens we're not doing bog gardens here let's not let's make sure we keep this distinction um, plus our native grasses and wildflowers these guys have extensive root systems they will dive into the soil they'll break it up and they will create channels that will help to move water into the soil more effectively uh, you know so this is very helpful if you do have a very dense heavy clay soil not to mention the habitat benefits of native plants uh, to offer to our surrounding wildlife as was uh, mentioned when we surveyed the importance of rain gardens earlier the image here you saw before now we're on slide 32 uh, this is a plan view um, taken uh, uh, of a, a design group called SWD, SWT uh, uh, Design. They're a firm in the St. Louis area, and they designed this location here. It's Indian Creek Lodge in Branson, Missouri. Um, you know, their big thing here was using natives, and um, you can see the pool, the, you know, the obvious pool there, but then there's some different water features down below, and these are actually the areas that are handling the stormwater runoff from the hillside. So if we go to our next slide, you can see the different images here, and I really, I really like the image there on the right, um, because if you think about where you are, you're in the Ozark Hills or the Ozark Mountains, as they're uh, called there, and it, it feels like you're 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 there in the wild. You know, the foreground just blends into the background because they've used these native plants, and so the site just fits in with its surroundings really beautifully. Um, Obviously, from the other images there on the left, you can see that there are some some more intentional features in there. We have hardscape, we have railings, we have lighting, uh, we have waterfalls, we have things to make this more aesthetically appealing. But we've also integrated in those those native plants there. So, um, you know, I think this is a, a a neat example of using natives uh, in the landscape and and also for the stormwater purposes. Okay. The next thing is I say let's make maintenance easy and let's plant in mass. Now this project, uh, you can see the arch in the background, so obviously we're in downtown St. Louis. And this is a project called City Garden. Um, you can see in the foreground here uh, several, uh, I believe those are sedges there that are planted right off of uh, walkway and roadway. And you can see those little cuts there in the curb, that's to let water in. Those are rain gardens right there. And how many different plants do you see in those rain gardens? one um, it's just a, a really good way to make maintenance easy so if we go to our next slide we're on slide 35 again we're uh, looking at a plan view of city garden and you know this I, I just wanted to throw this in here just to illustrate we're in a downtown we're in an urban area and you know this is just a, a really neat landscape if you're ever in the area I suggest you go check it out um, it was designed by Nelson Bird Woltz. Uh, it's a firm out in Virginia. And so this is a really neat place. Uh, any of the, the pale yellow areas, um, you can see they have, those are the areas that have rain gardens. And I don't know if I can draw in here or not. Oh, I think I can. So these are rain gardens here within the park. And then these, these areas on the edge along the roadway, these are also rain gardens right here. Um, you know, and along here also. So, um, so this is just really neat. I think this is a fun place to go. Let's look at a couple more pictures. You can see here, they've made maintenance easy, and they've created a very unified design by selecting just a few different species of plants. But they have planted lots of them, and these are natives, especially uh, some of them. Um, you know, and, and those natives, they do take some time to establish. So you have to account for some weed management those couple years. And if you have a simplified plant palette, it's going to make it easier for you to tell what's desirable and what's a weed. Um, you know, and when those plants are poking up in the spring, it's, it's kind of tough to tell. So lower maintenance there. 
Um, so you can see, I think in the images here, we're looking at switchgrass. Uh, I think there is some some bee balm there, um, in the planted in the in the middle uh, of the switchgrass. So um, and and also if you know. We're not all just one form, so if you want to do some type of accent, some type of single specimen, that could really stand out. That could be a, a great, um, you know, design choice there. So a bold color amongst this more uh, uniform color, um, or, or contrast the the it with some different texture or some different form. You know, that's the way to, uh, you know, change it up a bit. You know, I want you to make sure that you know you you determine what is your look in a rain garden. Rain gardens come in all different types, all different shapes and sizes, um, and they also follow the same rules as any other garden design. This is a landscape feature. It has both aesthetic and functional purposes. And I think when it comes to rain gardens and, and other fun green infrastructure type projects, there's no need to sacrifice aesthetics for function or vice versa. Um, so, you know, just make sure it fits in with your aesthetic and that it also remains functional. On our next slide, and we are on slide, uh, I think it's slide 38, um, you know, be creative. Rain gardens, they can be any shape. They can fit almost any landscape situation. Um, you know, it's not all kidney shape, folks. So these, what you see here pictured, these are more constructed rain gardens. Obviously, it's not something you would typically find in a suburban uh, residence. Um, you know, so, and also look, uh, the picture on the, the right there in the upper right, you can see that that rain garden's planted with one species again. So again, uh, easy maintenance. Uh, and also, take a look at that brick coming away from each rain garden. What do you think that's used for? Well, we're going to zoom out here in the next picture, and we're going to check this out. You can see that there is actually a series of rain gardens here, and they have all been chained together um, by these brick runnels uh, that are going through this little uh, little courtyard area. Um, so, and, and it chains each one together, and it assists with overflow. And these are the rain gardens. They are in. Uh, they're at Portland State University campus, uh, so if anybody knows how to handle stormwater, people in Portland, Oregon surely do. Another good tip here is you want to make sure to elevate paths and protect your soil. After you amend the soil to facilitate this good drainage, the last thing you want to do is have people tromping through your garden, compacting it back down. So use stepping stone, bridges, pavers, something to direct the flow of traffic through the garden. You know, you make sure just to avoid walking on the soil. Think about how you want, um, how you want to, or how you want visitors to experience a rain garden, and go from it from that approach. Um, and, and also, as you can see from the images here, uh, this kind of progression of this rain garden. This is the same rain garden, how it's matured. Uh, you can see that you know most rain gardens they mature into these masses of native plants. It's very different from our normal idea of landscaping, of everything is pruned to its little ball and has its little privacy bubble, and no other plant needs to encroach in that privacy bubble. Um, so you know these rain gardens can be very different. You know, they don't always have to be big and sprawling, but if yours is more of this, um, uh, you know, masses of plants type uh, rain garden, maintain the edge uh, of the rain garden. Enhance it with stones, with some type of edging. Put paths through there. Put benches in your rain garden. Make it look like you have intended this look. And and people will, people who might be a skeptical, you know, just hearing this, they might come and see, and they might realize, oh, well, this is actually really nice. It, you know, a lot of this is intentional. This is not just a weedy mess. Okay, let's talk about rain garden construction. This is my last section here. Andrew's going to take over after this. Um, if you do have questions, again, um, I see we do have some here in the, the chat box. Feel free to keep putting those in the chat box. Um, and at the end here, feel free to activate your mic after Andrew's done talking and, and ask if you, if you don't have access to a computer. Okay, let's get into rain garden construction. So now we've done all the preliminary work. We've calculated. We have drawn a plan. Now it's time to break some ground here. So your rain garden should be positioned somewhere to trap water from your downspout, from a patio, from a lawn, somewhere. 
it's always best to position a rain garden as close as possible to the drainage sources. Again, we want to avoid those gushing streams of water, which we get when water starts to uh, concentrate itself, you know, from m multiple sources. So, um, you know, always make sure that you you uh, know what the velocity is of the water coming into your rain garden. We'll talk on that too in a second. All right, you know. Pretty simple, same thing that we do for building most garden beds. Use a rope, hose, paint, something to lay out the boundary of our future rain garden. On slide uh, 44 here, you know, we then start to remove any existing vegetation. Now, my favorite here is uh, pictured on the left here is a sod cutter. Um, and this makes removal of ex uh, existing vegetation like lawn very easy. But Remember, you still have to pick all that sod up and you have to haul it away. So essentially, you are carrying your lawn away. So that's a little little bit of physical work there. Um, if you have weedy areas or spots that have really aggressive weeds, treat with a glyphosate herbicide. You know, this will help keep those weeds from persisting into your new rain garden. Next, we want to uh, dig the actual rain garden. and. A lot of people think it needs to be like more of a saucer shaped. Actually, we want to keep the bottom as level as possible because we want to distribute the water over as much surface area as we can. We don't want to concentrate it all in one spot. So dig the garden to a depth of about three to four inches. Again, um, you know, we can go up to eight, no deeper than 12 inches. Um, you know, we just don't recommend that. So nice and level base. You can see there on the image there on the, the right and those on the left, um, just how they've kept it uh, very level on the bottom and they've just kind of beveled that edge and they just kind of angled that edge down. Okay. Um, you know, building your rain garden, you know, we want to prepare our soil. Uh, if we have really heavy clay soil, you know, we're going to want to add some organic matter. Uh, we get this organic matter through compost, high quality topsoil. We apply this in a layer and we incorporate this as deeply really as we can. We want to go anywhere from 3 to 12 inches deep to really break apart any of that heavy clay soil. Now, if you do your infiltration test and you find out your water drains 8 or more inches per day, uh, then you probably don't need any amendments uh, because that is just, you know, as an adequate uh, drainage rate. So again, that's 8 or more inches per day. You likely do not need any soil amendments. Inlets and outlets. Let's not forget about these guys. We, we hit them earlier. Let's hit them again now. Um, so where water enters and exits a rain garden, it's always best to armor those spots with some type of gravel, a large flat stone. This way the water breaks on those and it dissipates its energy. These spots, the, the inlets and outlets, they experience the higher velocity of, of water when they're, um, you know, which means we get more erosion. So you can see in the image here, um, uh, you know, the outlet is on the right side of the screen, how we, we've armored it uh, here at this rain garden here uh, as the water leaves the rain garden. Can't really see the inlet, it's actually up in the top, uh, you know, more left towards the sidewalk, um, but there is actually a stone right there to help break some of that water, uh, you know, right there and dissipate some energy as it moves into the rain garden. This next image, I really like this image. It's a project I worked on out at Kansas um, where we uh, designed and, and built some rain gardens at a local zoo there. Um, now in this image, you know, you're going to have to imagine a little bit on the right, uh, a big uh, asphalt drive, a parking lots up uphill from here. All this water when it rains uh, comes washing down and the North American uh, zoo exhibits are to the left side of the photograph. And so the bald eagles, the fox, the raccoons, they're getting flooded out every time it rains. And so they really needed something to, to channel this water and to, to slow it down and hold it and infiltrate it into the soil. And so what we did here, uh, since it was such a massive amount of water sheeting off, and also they had uh, specific constraints, you know, they didn't want tall vegetation growing up to the sidewalk because, you know, heaven forbid if the tiger escaped, you know, they, they didn't want the tiger just reaching out and grabbing someone from the sidewalk. Um, so what we did, we actually planted the edge here in buffalo grass. And the buffalo grass really worked well to, um, you know, hold the soil because it spreads. Um, you know, it knits the soil together and, you know, it, it, it dissipated that energy when it hit it. It prevented erosion. It really slowed that water down before it entered the rain garden, which you can see is the taller plants there in the center. So 
again, just be creative how you move water in and out of the garden. You can use rain chains, you can bury pipe, you can have a grass swale, a dry creek bed. If you do a dry creek bed, maybe put some little waterfalls, make it interesting. Um, you know, different things you can do. Uh, always best to avoid large quantities of sediment from settling into the rain garden. Fine sediment particles, they'll clog pathways in the soil, which uh, which will which are draining water. So if you have a rain garden that has always drained well in the past and has started to hold water now uh, for longer periods of time, this might be your problem. So a catchment basin or some type of a sediment basin is uh, you know what we recommend. Not a great photo for this, um, but you can see the black arrow here is actually pointing to this outlet coming uh, in this culvert here underneath the sidewalk and there is this flat stone it's angled up to slow the water down and so the water actually drops some of that sediment before it enters into the rain garden and when that sediment basin fills up you just take a flat bottom, bottom shovel and you just scoop it out and you put it in your compost pile or in a landscape bed and this photo here is just another example of a, a sediment basin or an area to break some of that water and dissipate some energy before it enters into the rain garden and th that is the portion I have for you today um, Andrew is up next uh, these are just the references I use to help me present the uh, put together this presentation the final one there uh, creating rain gardens capturing rain for your own uh, water efficient garden that's kind of a fun one if you're really serious about getting into this a great little step-by-step -step design uh, a guide which which I used a lot of uh, images for this uh, presentation uh, I don't know if I necessarily go with all of the plant recommendations because uh, I do recommend purple loose strife but um, uh, but the, the design guidelines are, are pretty spot on. So that is all I have for you. And now I am going to let Andrew take over and start talking to you a little bit about rain garden plants. So thank you very much, everyone. Questions, feel free, type them in or ask at the end of the session. Hello, everyone. This is Andrew Holsinger, and I'm going to be talking to you today about rain garden plants. So you should be on slide 52, and we are going to proceed on to slide 53. So the first question that should enter your mind is determining what type of rain garden you wish to establish. So we have a variety of uh, plant materials that can be used and so you may think of a woodland or a wetland prairie whether it's going to be in your front yard or backyard whether you're looking for a more formal or natural look and native plants are often used as well as shrubs and grasses and even possibly trees for establishing a rain garden and you'll also have to think about wet and dry conditions and that's why we particularly lean towards the native plants is because they can tolerate both wet and dry conditions so on plant selection you're going to want to use drought tolerant plants uh, call it a rain garden these rain gardens can go uh, with a period of drought and so you have to consider that when planning you want to avoid plants that require well-drained soils because they're in a rain garden it does get wet and it's not always uh, consistent with that type of environment you want to plant the plant roots will maintain and increase soil porosity so one thing that wasn't mentioned in the earlier portion with Chris is compaction you want to make sure that you have a loose uh, soil so it can have those pore spaces to uh, collect as much water and to integrate that into the rain garden and you may have to add uh, mulch so it could be gravel or wood and shredded hardwood mulch is the best to use for a rain garden there's uh, three different zones in a rain garden and these are not just uh, numerical bullet points but there are the zone one which is the center so that's going to be your wettest zone zone two are your side slopes they can experience some occasional flooding 
and zone three, your upper areas, so your berm or your boundary, and that's going to be your driest zone. And I'll show you an example here in this slide 56. You can see that you have uh, the water, the aquatic plant life, and where it's saturated, and then you move up to the upland moist, and so it is really your zone two, and then you have your upland dry area. So this is going to be the dry rim of the brain garden. And here's a, a diagram to show the wet area is in the middle, then your moist area, and then your dry berm or your upland dry. So, as Chris said, the floor can be eight inches below grade or sometimes less. It, it depends on how much of the rain you are capturing. And so here we have zone one, which would be saturated. So the, the plants right underneath the numeral one are the plants that are going to be saturated and be the wettest. Then we have saturated moist. Then we have our drier slopes, which are zone two. And then we have moist dry. And then the top rim, or the surrounding perimeter, is going to be dry with zone three. So how many plants are you going to need to plant? So you can take the square footage that you have and then you can plan your spacing accordingly. So at 18 inch spacing, divide your total square footage by 2.25. So that gives you one plant per 2.25 square feet. At a 12 inch spacing, you need one plant per square foot. And at two foot spacing, divide your total square footage by four. So for 100 square feet, divide by four, that gives you 25 plants that you'll need to plant. So we have our hydric zone, or our very wet zone. And these are some examples of uh, the plants that we'll be talking about. And so I'll go ahead and talk about those. We have the blue flag iris. So it has some handsome foliage that's uh, really good all season long. And it's an excellent choice for a uh, rain garden in, in the, the wet zone. As I said, it has nice foliage. It's native to Illinois. And it has full sun, part shade. We also have button bush. So button bush, it uh, is, adapts to many soil types. And it's a tremendous source for hummingbirds, butterflies, and other pollinators. And it's... Uh, Pruning is not usually necessary, and it can be done in early spring to shape the plant. But uh, if you ever need to revitalize it, it can be cut back uh, near to the ground in the early spring. We have the cardinal flower with its tremendous vibrant red flowers. It makes for an excellent cut flower. Sometimes it may uh, self-seed in optimum conditions, so it really likes a disturbed soil around it to uh, st stimulate the seeds to germinate. And here's another uh, photograph of the cardinal flower. Here we have sensitive fern. And the, the way that it got its name, Sensitive Fern, is because it's sensitive to uh, the fall frost. Usually the first fall frost, the leaves will turn brown. It's also sensitive to drought. We have swamp milkweed. It has a pink bloom. It thrives in the sun or and also an average and moist soil. And it's also deer resistant. So that can be a, an advantage for your rain garden. We have sneezeweed. 
It uh, blooms in August through October. It's a butterfly attractant. It's a native plant that does well in full sun. You can remove the spent flowers to encourage additional bloom. And you can cut plants back by half after they flower. Chinese astilbe, it's an easily grown plant. It has uh, prolonged, uh, removing the faded flower stalks to, doesn't prolong the bloom, but it might improve the plant appearance. So you can consider that. Then we have our rain garden plants for our moderately wet zone, so the mesic area. So I'll be talking about these plants next. So we'll start out with Joe Pie Weed. It can be a uh, rather tall plant, but uh, the, the nursery trade and industry has been working on uh, bringing out some shorter varieties. And so there's a little Joe Pie Weed that's a, a different uh, species, but it uh, can do fairly well. And the flowers are quite attractive to butterflies. We have the royal fern, and the fronds typically turn yellow to brown in the autumn. And the osmonda uh, fiber is used for potting up orchids. And so it can also be uh, tolerated by rabbits. We have winterberry, which uh, good for floral arrangements. It uh, prefers wet soil and has uh, nice nice berries for interest. Blue vervain, it can uh, colonize and form colonies, but it also can be short-lived, but it is a, an attractive plant for butterflies. Here's another photo of blue vervain. We have the New England aster, which has some striking color. You can find it in bloom right now during this time of the year. It does not need to be staked. It uh, is a very attractive plant. And it can tolerate uh, saturated or dry soil. Here's another photo of the New England aster. We also have our rain garden plants that are moist dry zone. So I'll detail these in our next section of slides. We have mountain mint and it uh, name can be misleading. It's not really grown in uh, places that are dry like a mountain, but it does well in moist areas. And so it uh, also is attractive to pollinators, and the leaves are very fragrant, hence the mint part of the name. We have spiderwort. This uh, particular cultivar is bilberry ice. It can... Uh, bloom freely. It has blue flowers. It's uh, relatively low maintenance, but you can clean it up in the early spring before it resumes growth. And the bilberry ice spider wart will grow to about 15 inches tall at maturity. And it's one that's usually planted in a, a mass. And here's another couple of examples of spider wart. We have prairie drop seed. This is a, a favorite of mine. I just uh, planted some in my yard this past week. It uh, can grow to th three feet high and has a th three feet spacing. has nice fall color and it is a native plant. And it also has a good drought tolerance. Rattlestink master, as you can see in the photo, it can uh, attract pollinators. It blooms in May through August, and it can add interest 
to the wildlife for the wildlife wild bergamot its bloom time is July to August and is attractive to bees and butterflies here's another slide of Minardia and culver's root it's a nectar source for butterflies and pollinators the seeds can be a benefit for birds like quail or pheasants and finches and it makes for a good cut flower and here are rain garden plants for the dry zone or the xeric uh, conditions so we have fragrant sumac it has a yellow red summer fruit uh, the medium green leaves can turn to attractive shades of orange red or purple and the grow low variety makes a good ground cover the gray dogwood which actually uh, I believe has been named uh, the rough leaved gray dogwood but there's some uh, particular cultivars lemon drops they can do well it does well in sun and shade and it also is native Virginia sweet spire this is a common plant in some of our landscapes but uh, it is uh, an attractive plant good for fall color and the white color of the flowers is really nice during the summer blazing star you have to find it at the right time for its uh, color for its blooms but it uh, attracts butterflies does very well in full sun it is a native plant butterfly weed is probably one of the most popular and most noted native plants that attract butterflies it doesn't do too whenever it's transplanted it has a deep taproot and it's probably left un best if it's undisturbed but it's a great host for the monarch butterfly and it, it also likes dry conditions here's another photo of butterfly weed we have a purple cone flower and the purple cone flower uh, the plants bloom for more than 12 weeks and there's a variety of sizes and it's attractant to birds and butterflies and we have the gray-headed coneflower which blooms from June to August in the full sun it can look uh, somewhat sparse if it's not planted in a mass because the leaves are pretty slender and it can look a little rough so probably suggest to plant it in a mass the species name of pinata is in reference to its pinnate leaves and you also need to think of the maintenance of rain gardens so you want to water the plants to establish a root system and make sure that if you go through a period of drought that your rain garden uh, does have rain it, it may not uh, survive uh, an extensive drought like we've had in the past year infiltration uh, prevents mosquitoes you want to remove the weeds that are uh, can encroach into your rain garden and you can also remove uh, you can set up uh, open access around your rain garden so you can get into the rain garden to do your weeding or to uh, set up areas as Chris said to collect the sediment so it's easier to remove you could add mulch to minimize the weeds and moderate soil temperatures and provide a more finished appearance and fertilizing is often unnecessary so I'd like to thank you for uh, listening in on our rain garden presentation here are some of the references that I used and the credit for the photographs and our contact information for Chris and myself 
So if anyone has any questions at this time, you can uh, turn on your microphones or chat in the chat box. I just wanted to address, uh, there was a question in the chat box, uh, do you always need a sediment basin? Um, you don't always need one. Um, I, I did type back and say, you know, the area draining into uh, the rain garden, you just have to go in, uh, you know, just evaluate things before you, you install it. Uh, if that area does seem to experience a lot of erosion, uh, if it looks like it will be picking up a lot of sediment as it's headed on its way to your rain garden, then yeah, you should probably have a sediment basin. Um, if you have a rain garden and you might be having sediment problems, you can always retrofit a sediment basin on that. You know, you just just wherever the inlet is, you just you kind of dig out a just a, a little dip, and uh, maybe put a little stone on the on the bottom there of the basin, and just to to hold the just to help scoop things out. Um, and, and also, if you're installing a rain garden, it might be just a good idea to put in the sediment basin. You know, we think about roofs as not having too much stuff, but I have seen uh, the stuff that comes out of gutters before, and it's just full of those little tiny asphalt particles that from from uh, asphalt shingles and uh, all other types of dust, things like that, that get in there. And so maybe just put a sediment basin in, put a stone on the bottom, see how much sediment you get after a couple of rain events. If you're not getting much, uh, then go ahead and just break that that little uh, the, the little dam down that you've created to make the basin just let it flow into the rain garden. I see a question about is butterfly weed invasive and I would uh, say no that it's not invasive if uh, anything it's been the opposite here recently that uh, we have not had a substantial amount of butterfly weed in our area to be a host plant for the monarch butterfly and with the recent news there's been uh, questions about how much uh, butterfly weed is available for the monarch butterfly and there are some efforts to actually plant more butterfly weed and I'd also like to note that there's a uh, a handout that was available that's uh, the rain gardens native plant list and it gives uh, the categories of the different plants and the planting zone for your rain garden uh, we're still happy to take any questions you might have uh, but if something comes up later you can always just give Andrew or myself an email and you know if you have a rain garden or if you're going to be installing one we'd love to know that too feel free to you know get in touch with your local extension officer again send us an email and then let us know and you know we're we're always interested to see you know kind of what the outcomes are of the program so just always feel free to reach out so it looks like we have some more questions coming in that's great so just want to put that out there thank you Andrew, do you want to you want to tackle the crayfish question? I'm not too sure on that one. Yeah, I'm not uh, certain on getting rid of the crayfish. I, I think some of the crayfish are just a natural component of a, a rain garden. Yeah, I, I I can see the the tunnels that they create as another great way of kind of opening that soil up giving a little bit more aeration to it so better drainage but um, you know that that might be a, a great question uh, to uh, maybe get in touch with one of our another educator of ours but you know you know we we'll, we're happy to find out if if somebody wants to take uh, down the, the whoever has the questions contact info we can get back to you on that uh, the next one is is there a role for a rain barrel in conjunction with the rain garden, um, you know, I, I think so. I think that's, um, it, I think it's great to to link different systems up, um, and, and as you said, like different, uh, there are rain garden chains. You know, they can chain them together. So there's no reason why you can't put a rain barrel there up really at the very front of that. And so, so certainly, I would say, 
uh, rain bale is a, a great uh, addition to the 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 system that you'll be creating to handle the stormwater on your property and then so any overflow that comes out of the rain barrel uh, that just will then flow into the the garden uh, just know that you know one rain barrel if, you, if that's all you're going to use you know on average they're 55 gallons one inch rainfall over a thousand square foot roof we're talking in excess of 550 over probably over 600 gallons of water so you're going to have plenty of water uh, making it through the rain barrel if the, you're just using the one kind of standard rain barrel. The next question, what if there is a lot of water draining into an area, how can that be dressed up? Well, if there's a, a lot of water that's coming into your rain garden, it, it could be uh, possibly dressed up. Uh, it also can be considered uh, a, a turf area in front of your rain garden to uh, allow for the flow of water into the rain garden could be beneficial and also you could have decorative stone at the entrance of your rain garden to help dress it up some and also you need to think about uh, how do you have an overflow outlet for where the the water is whenever it does overflow so that may may have not been uh, mentioned as much in our presentation um, next question here uh, why is it not necessary to fertilize well um, if if you do use predominantly native plants then you won't have to be worrying about uh, usually fertilizing them because very often the native plants don't even outside of a rain garden they they require very little fertilizer um, it, it really none at all and, and and plus if you think about it you know we talk about sediment basins and trying to lower get that down in areas that see a lot of standing water or water where it, it might congregate you're still going to get that sediment that sediment's also going to be holding some uh, you know some type of nutritional value there might be you know a little bit a little bit there a little bit of organic matter in that and so that, it, it, it would provide an adequate amount of uh, nutrients for your plants um, and so yeah I don't know if Andrew if you have anything to add to that as well well uh, a key component of a rain garden can be to filter out non-point source pollution and some of that non-point source pollution can be fertilizers that have uh, been brought into the with the rainwater from possibly a field or your lawn fertilizers that have been applied that that, that uh, non-point source means there's not a, a pipe that you can go and track it down to but there's all kinds of uh, pollutants you know you have your grease and oils and other things possibly from uh, your driveways or pave, paved areas so a rain garden is a, a good way to filter some of those pollutants out before they reach our rivers and streams and make it down to uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the, the problems that they've had with fertilizers reaching down to the Gulf of Mexico And yes, if you want to get rid of crayfish, uh, uh, it looks like raccoons are the answer. So if you need some raccoons, you know I have some I can send out your way. Just let me know. The question is, is how far apart should you plant plants? Well, it somewhat depends on the culture of the plant, but you can expect for uh, your plants to fill in, but you should uh, probably look at the label of the plant or uh, 
consult with uh, your local extension educator on how how the plant will uh, which plants you're selecting and one th one thought was uh, presented in another presentation I looked over that well if you plant a rain garden that it doesn't matter where you put the plants at as long as you have enough plants for the amount of space that is being uh, developed into the rain garden but you have to take into consideration those zones and the cultural uh, needs of the different plants and where you're placing them and that's why the the plants were presented in the way that they were because they are site specific so it depends on the plant And, and I'll just add, you know, if you are going the natives route, a lot of those uh, native plants, they will concentrate those first few years on establishing good root systems. And uh, so, you know, that's when a lot of the weed pressure will, you know, that's when you'll be facing a lot of it. So uh, just have to account for that. Um, and, you know, and, and again, it does depend on the, the type of plant and even varieties then. But... Um, so yeah, but I, I would expect you know you would have a couple of years of of establishment to go through uh, before those native plants really started to take off. And I'd also say, depending on what your plant selection was, if you have a particular plant that does well in where it's placed, you know, we say the right plant in the right place, that it could uh, fill in quicker or maybe even unexpectedly fill in uh, greater than what it was anticipated. And it looks like uh, Fulton County there uh, expresses that exactly, sleep, creep, and leap, so exactly. The question is, does prairie drop seed need full sun? And uh, the answer is it does need full sun. Yeah, and, and even out in the prairie, I often see uh, prairie drop seed out in, in the full sun areas. And it, prairie drop seed, it's really neat to see out in the prairie because it kind of grows in these big colonies. And um, it's just it's a great plant, uh, one of my favorites. Um, let's see, I'm, uh, as a master gardener, I find, I'm sorry, I cannot, I, let's see, a lot of texters? I don't know what those are. Might, I might ask you to just, um. I don't know. Clarify. Clarify that, yeah. Um, I, kn I know we probably threw a lot of information at you. This uh, about hour, hour and 15 minutes, maybe hour and a half now. Um, we are starting to record these sessions and we're posting them online so uh, okay uh, so we're posting these recordings online so if you know you just got to wait uh, you know a couple probably a couple months and um, you know contact your local extension office to get the link uh, to the YouTube site where these will be posted so you can review some of what we said uh, Martha said they're probably speaking the question uh, Perhaps they could type it out. Okay, I guess Ling actually tries to translate what people uh, say. So uh, UIE Mondo uh, Livingston, I, I, I think. Um, could you type the question out? Because apparently Link is trying to put your, if you're speaking, trying to put it into text form, and it's not really translating it quite, quite right. Um question that was clarified as a master gardener I find 
a lot of people want to use other plants instead. Well, I would say that there also can be a rain garden failure if the attention to the plants is not put forth in the proper plant selected for the situation. But uh, non-native plants can be used in situations of a rain garden. Yeah, they, they not, we can still use non-natives. Uh, and there are some great adapted plants out there. Uh, we, we surely just want to make sure that we steer clear of any type of the, the invasives uh, types of plants, especially, you know, again, that that book I, I, I recommended earlier, one of the plants they recommend is purple loosestrife, and we don't want to be planting that uh, to escape into our wetlands uh, in the least. So uh, I, I'd say just be mindful of what plants are being selected, and it doesn't always have to be a native, but it does have to be a plant that's well adapted to the situation and that won't escape. Yes, and uh, they responded, I try to tell them to start right, yes, so get off on the right foot and then, you know, it's it's easy walking then. Well, Andrew and I were happy to stick around for another, you know, 10 minutes till we hit 3 o'clock, but we do want to thank everybody for participating today and, uh, you know, thank you again for, you know, participating in that poll in the beginning. And and please, again, just let us know, uh, you know, what your experience are, you know, when you take this information home and and, and just let us know. So uh, just thank you very much. And uh, any more questions, we'll be here uh, for another 10 minutes or so. But Thank you for those that are checking out. You know what uh, interested me, Chris, is that it seemed to be kind of a lack of rain gardens here in Illinois when we were trying to find pictures and uh, rain gardens as examples. That it was a we had a little bit of difficulty in trying to find rain gardens. Yes, we did. We had a lot of difficulty. I mean, that's why. I mean, the projects I showed you. There's one in Branson. There's one in St. Louis. Uh, you know, not really in Illinois, and and I know there's rain gardens out there. It's just we don't have, uh, there are not very many visible rain gardens. I I should say, and and there are some stormwater projects that are really neat. I think things that are going around the Chicago land area, but um, you know, for Andrew and I, we're down in central and southern and southern ish Illinois, and so uh, hey, we'd love to see what rain garden projects are going around in our neck of the woods too. So please send us send us pictures, send us emails.